SCM have been involved in peace activism for years and they're brilliant bunch of students who are living out their faith in action and I was lucky enough to be their faith in action project worker for a few years so this was me taking some students to the DSEI Arms Fair in London. Um, now before I got involved with SCM I had never heard of DSEI or DICE as it's kind of called in peace activist circles um, I'd never heard of it, but it's this huge arms fair that takes place every two years in London. Um, it's facilitated by the UK government. The government provides insurance for these arms fairs. They invite people from around the world to come to these arms fairs. And they essentially provide a huge platform for arms dealers to sell weapons to countries who are known to be abusing human rights. Um, they invite countries like Bahrain, like Saudi Arabia, who are committing horrible, horrible acts of conflict against their own people and against people in other countries who are using these weapons to kill and to injure. And uh, the UK government facilitates this because we make a lot of money from the sale of arms. Um, so I found this really shocking when I first got involved and I'd never heard about it before. It's all kept very kind of not secretive in a kind of uh, conspiracy theory way, but it's not talked about. It's not really that widely known. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's really quite vile. So I have been joining in with going down every two years and we sit in the road and try and stop um, the lorries from delivering the arms to the arms fair um, and stop uh, people profiting from war um, and that's yeah so that's kind of my background for getting involved with, with peace activism um, but the more I looked into it over the last few years the more I realised the links between um, peace activism and climate activism so uh, the two campaigns that I was working on while I was at SCM were peace and climate activism and the more you kind of dig below the surface the more you realise they are intertwined. Um, so a few statistics about climate and the military and how they're linked. Um, military carbon emissions are estimated to be about six percent of the global total of the total global carbon emissions, which is actually massive. Like when you consider how relatively small a aspect of society the military is it's yeah six percent it's about equal to the carbon emissions from food waste that we were talking about a few weeks ago um so it's on a similar scale to that issue um which as we learned then is really big and really bad <laughs> so similarly the carbon emissions of military activities around the world are really big and really bad um the carbon footprint, or as it's sometimes called bootprint, of the US military is higher than that of most countries. So the carbon footprint of Morocco, the carbon footprint of Peru, the carbon footprint of Finland, the carbon footprint of Sweden are all smaller than the carbon footprint of just the US military, um, which is ridiculous. So this, the military complex, um, is a huge contributor to global carbon emissions. Um, something I was really shocked to learn is that due to a loophole in the Paris Agreement, militaries are exempt from most carbon reduction targets. So countries, when they're reporting on their um, carbon footprint um, to kind of show how they're keeping in line with the promises made in the Paris Agreement, they don't have to report on the carbon emissions of their military which just seems ridiculous because as we've seen it's a huge contributor to our carbon footprint so why is it being left out why is the military being given special treatment all makes me very angry um and not only is the military a huge contributor to our carbon emissions but our carbon emissions are a huge part of our military activity in that two thirds of all EU military missions monitor and secure the production and transport of oil and gas to Europe. So 
a huge amount of the activities that our military are used for and are getting involved with is purely to secure fossil fuels for us in the West that we are reliant on. Um, so it kind of, these two huge problems feed into each other in that the military is causing all these emissions and these emissions are causing us to have to spend on military just to protect, protect our own kind of resources. Um, does that make sense? Hopefully that gives like a little bit of background, starts to paint a little bit of a picture as to how these two things are linked um, and why these two problems can't be treated separately and need to be treated together. Uh, um, climate breakdown and global war and conflict and the people who profit from that. Um, so looking, taking a step back, looking at why we invest so much money in these military operations and why this military carbon footprint is so huge. What are we, what are we actually achieving with that? What are we using it for? It's often kind of taken as a bit of a given that all countries need a military. Countries need to be protecting themselves. Um, and we obviously need a huge army and lots of fighter jets to be doing so. Um, but most people kind of agree when they take a step back that uh, this might not be the best use of our resources. Um, so generally what are considered to be some of the biggest security threats um, to our societies these days. Uh, one of the biggest is the climate emergency. Um, the breakdown of climate is damaging people's homes, it's causing mass migration, it's causing scarcity of resources, um, it's displacing people, it's causing um, millions of people to, to become homeless and to be living um, in dangerous situations and that obviously is one of the biggest contributors to um, global insecurity and global conflict. Um, now and certainly will become increasingly so in the next few years, in the next few decades. Um, mass migration, so people moving around, again, largely due to the climate emergency. Um, global pandemics, I found it interesting, this is all from a report called Fighting the Wrong Battles, which was um, published by the Federation for Reconciliation, who are a great peace charity. And the report was published in February 2020. Um, and it had this whole section on global pandemics and how they're going to be a huge issue over the next few decades and cause all these problems. And uh, we've all kind of seen that and learned that that is true over the past couple of years. Um, Cyber security, obviously, most, as with most things, battles aren't being fought person to person these days, they're being fought screen to screen. And it's all, um, cyber security is one of the biggest threats that we face. Um, and obviously global poverty, again, similarly to the climate emergency, causes scarcity, um, causes conflict and causes, um, sadly, security threats around the world. So all of that goes to, leads us to the question, is investing in military force the best way to protect ourselves from these things? Is this huge military operation and these huge military um, carbon footprints really necessary? Are there better things we could be investing in to prevent these threats? Hmm. Can you guess my answer? Yes, <laughs> there are better things to be investing in. Um, and we well, can have a think about what those are later. So, excuse me, I'm gonna have a drink of water. So, um, as I said before, one of the biggest problems is that wars aren't just happening. Um, they're a conscious decision that people are making huge profits from selling all these arms and um, from the unrest that's caused by all these problems around the world. Um, global unrest and uncertainty caused by things like pandemics and climate breakdown are driving up profits for arms dealers. People are making money from the problems that they're causing. Um, the climate emergency is seen as what's called a threat multiplier. So um, as climate breakdown um, happens, there's more and more insecurity, there's more and more um, scarcity of resources, there's more and more conflict, there's more and more military activity, which causes more and more carbon emissions, which causes more and more climate breakdown, and the loop continues. So um, 
these things are kind of creating a feedback loop that they're making each other worse. And it's going to be one of the, the many, many kind of things that as climate breakdown gets worse, kind of, what's the word when something kind of gets worse and worse exponentially? It's going to go like this, where they cause each other to, um, yeah, massively keep getting worse and we have to break the cycle at some point. Um, and to show how intertwined these threats are, um, Talis, who are one of the biggest arms dealers around the world, described um, climate breakdown as a financial opportunity in the area of public safety. So rather than seeing climate, the climate emergency as saying, oh, this is a terrible thing, we should be really, really concerned. They're thinking, haha, more money in our pockets, because sadly it's going to mean more and more conflict and more and more war. So hopefully that paints a bit of a picture again as to why we need to tackle climate, just, climate justice and um, be campaigning for a move towards a greener society in order to be protecting ourselves against conflict and building a more peaceful society. I hope I'm making sense of that and you can kind of see, see the picture we're building up. Um, so, obviously, one of the biggest conversations that's going on around peace activism at the minute is about Ukraine. Um, kind of peacemaking and anti-war uh, thinking has been really prevalent in the news recently and thinking about how we can prevent and, and de-escalate tension um, globally has been back on the agenda. Um, which obviously is deeply concerning and heartbreaking, but also um, kind of shines a light on the fact that um, these conflicts are going on all around the world and these tensions are there bubbling under the surface all the time. Um, so to kind of see really tangibly how these two things are linked, how climate and um, conflict are linked, uh, the situation really kind of paints a picture. So Putin's regime has profited from the sale of fossil fuels. Russia's um, main source of income is oil and gas. that It sells to the EU and countries all around the world. And that's where most of its power comes from. Most of its um, economic force comes from. Um, and it's used the profits from those fossil fuels to engage in military operations in Georgia, in Syria, and now in Ukraine. Um, as we know, the UK have been imposing sanctions on Russia, but many, many people have claimed that the sanctions don't go far enough. And one of the reasons that we aren't able to impl implement as many sanctions as a lot of people would like to see is that we are relying on Russia for our um, energy. It's been in the news loads recently how much the UK, the UK relies on Russian oil and gas. Um, energy prices have skyrocketed and we've kind of we're saying that we're urgently going to move away from Russian oil and gas but this would have been so much easier if we'd already been moving towards renewables and um, been trying to kind of curb our reliance on fossil fuels for the infrastructure of our society. Um, Extinction Rebellion in Ukraine have called for action against major energy companies supplying the EU from Russia as kind of the main way that um, we're going to be able to prevent further conflict in Ukraine and de-escalate the violence that's going on there. Um, this, yeah, the reliance on Russian energy and um, Russian resources is going to be really key to ending the conflict there. Um, and yeah, Svetlana Krakowska, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, is um, one of Ukraine's leading climate experts and was a representative to the Intergovern Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I think I've got that acronym right, the IPCC. Um, she was a representative there and she summed it up saying, human-induced climate change and the war in Ukraine have the same roots fossil fuels and our dependence on them. Um, so yeah, that's how that kind of 
plays out in Ukraine, that's um, how we can really, really clearly and tangibly see how these two things are linked. Um, so I love these little figures. They featured more throughout this presentation when I did it with SCM and they've kind of just only appeared now in this version. Um, but look at more having a nice time protesting, aren't I? Um, so now that we understand the issue a little bit, we are going to join in, as Anna said, Greenpeace's campaign, um, which really, uh, yeah, tackles both of these issues at once. So to achieve peace in Ukraine and prevent more global conflict, we need to break our reliance on fossil fuels. We urgently need the EU to stop investing in Russian oil and gas. And that is what we are going to be asking for in this campaign. Um, so Greenpeace are asking us to call on UK and EU finance institutions to stop funding the Russian invasion. So these huge finance institutions are um, obviously trying to make money and investing in Russian um, resources. And so this campaign is all about asking them uh, to stop providing finance to Russian fossil fuel companies and transition away from fossil fuel investments towards investment in renewable energy and energy efficiency. Um, I was reading just before this on um, the campaign against the arms trade website about how um, the move to renewable energy uses lots and lots of the same skills and um, kind of industry sectors as the arms trade in the UK. So moving to, away from um, creating arms and dealing arms and making our money off of the sale of arms to countries who are using them for all these horrible reasons will be really, really helped by investing in renewable energy and um, marine and wind energy. Yeah, I feel like I've not summed that up very well, but basically <laughs> the, it's a really, really direct route from divesting our, our country's money away from military and uh, the arms trade. We can create more jobs and green jobs and sustainable jobs in renewable energy um, just by choosing to invest on money differently. So... That I think is the aim of this campaign and that's what we're going to be doing today. So I think we, well, we are making some flowers, which I would like us to send to the CEO of Schroders. And Schroders are one of these 10 biggest finance institutions that Greenpeace are targeting. They're based in London. We've got an address for them. It's on their website. We know who their CEO is. He's a guy called Peter Harrison. Um, and so I think it would be really nice to send him a sunflower and ask him very nicely to think about uh, using his money to help end the conflict in Ukraine and to help build a greener, more peaceful society with our beautiful sunflowers and our reflective craftivist creations. Does that sound about right, Anna? That sounds great. Thank you so much, Emma. No worries. Yeah, that's the end. Um, yeah, does anyone, I mean, 